Hello and welcome to My Career in Data, a podcast where we discuss with industry leaders and experts how they have built their careers. I am your host, Shannon Kemp, and today we're talking to Ben Schein at Domo. With a robust catalog of courses offered on demand and industry-leading live online sessions throughout the year, the Dataversity Training Center is your launchpad for career success. Browse the complete catalog at training.dataversity.net and use code DVTALKS for 20% off your purchase. Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Officer at Dataversity and this is My Career in Data, a Dataversity Talks podcast dedicated to learning from those who have careers in data management to understand how they got there and to be talking with people who make those careers a little bit easier. To keep up to date in the latest in data management education, go to dataversity.net forward slash subscribe. Today, we are joined by Ben Shine, the Senior Vice President of Product at Domo. And normally, this is where a podcast host would read a short bio of the guest, but in this podcast, your bio is what we're here to talk about. Ben, hello and welcome. Thanks, Shannon. Uh, really happy to be here to talk about data, data careers, data journeys, all that fun stuff. You know, when we started this podcast, you were one of the first people that I thought of because when I first met you, your uh title was a vice president of of data curiosity we had a great conversation around that so i'm really excited to dive into this and now congratulations on your promotion you're the senior vice president of product at domo so yes. let's start with what is domo and what is it that you're currently doing yeah no uh so domo i'm um, really talking about domo as a data experience platform uh right so we're creating bespoke meaningful relevant data experiences um, for our users, for people everywhere. And, and really those those experiences to us um, should be, you know, unlocking data, not just for a data scientist or someone with data in their title, um, but really that they should be experiences that um, everyone in the organization, right? I think you, you know, there's lots of studies and research you can look at that, you know, five or 10% of, of people actually use data in an organization. And our goal is that our data experiences are accessible to everyone. Um, even if you're on a you know factory floor or in a retail outlet or a coffee hut or whatever it is, that data and the, an experience with data is impactful. Um, and ultimately, the, the reason we want that is because we want everyone to have um, you know an impact on their business or their organization, right? A, a positive impact, an exponential impact, um, if you do that correctly. Um, and so that's sort of our, our overall vision is to create those data experiences so that everyone can have a positive impact on their business. Um, all that being said, that sounds great and it's aspirational. I get to see that a lot with our customers. Um, the day-to-day -day can certainly be a little different. I, I, I used to joke that I could never give up the data curiosity title because it was too good of an intro and a hook um, and all those things. And, and for a long time I did it and I, it really let me um, expand as a thought leader around data, um, as you know, you know, a coach and a mentor to our customer base. Um, as an advisor and an input uh, to our product teams and how we're developing things. Um, but the chance in January to really um, take over all our overall product strategy, including product management and UX, um, really was 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 too good of a chance and to do those things, to create those great data experiences. And so uh, while I still have that that love for the, for the title, um, I do joke that I feel like before people listen to me and now they listen to me, right? It's a different, a different kind of listen, not that they weren't, you know, I, I had an input, but now I have a lot more say. And so day to day, what does that mean? Um, where do I see my job and my role in the company? I think a lot of times it's about connecting dots, right? There's lots of um, different work going on, you know, in different areas of our product and the different components that make up the data experience platform, whether it's, you know, magic ETL or it's the data sets or data ingestion or integration or visualization or app building. And so a lot of times I'm trying to have that big picture and say, well, you know, how do these things connect? How do I, you know, maybe solve multiple problems in one way so we can be efficient with our resources. Um, and so some of that's just my own observation and my own, you know, I use the product. They actually checked when I when I took this job in January, I, and I have the the card in Domo somewhere, but I, in my time at Target before Domo and at Domo, I've created 
um, almost over 18,000 different objects, you know, visualizations, data sets, data transformations. Um, and so I use it. And so I bring that perspective as a practitioner to, to the product strategy. Um, but also part of my job is, is how do we, how do we listen to the signal? How do we listen to customers, listen to users, um, both their actual voice and their sort of derived voice in the data that we have about what they're doing, right? Um, you know, how do we, how do we let that be the fuel, but not always the, you know, it's, it's not always about doing exactly what someone's asking. It's okay, well, what's the pain? What's the friction? Let me understand that underlying friction. And then let me connect those dots and say, well, these five frictions that customers might be articulating in different ways uh, actually can be solved together holistically by um, reducing this friction, creating a better experience, letting people have that business impact. And so um, that's a lot of fun. I mean, there's frustrating moments for sure. And a lot of different um, people and, 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 and stakeholders to, to try to, to balance, whether it's industry analysts versus our own internal teams versus our customers and our leadership and marketing. But um, but it's it, it's a lot of fun day to day too, most days at least. I love it. That is so great. And we'll come back to that a little bit in a moment because it um, to your uses of data. That's uh, very interesting. But let's let's back up a little bit to begin yeah. with. And so tell me, Ben, when you were in elementary school, was this the dream? Did you dream that I'm going to grow up and be the senior VP yes. of product? So definitely wasn't the dream. I will say I always was probably a little dorky. What one of the things that comes to mind from that time period is I was obsessed with airports and designs and like mm -hmm. looking at airport maps and when we go to the airport, like how are the gates arranged? And well, in Atlanta they do a train and at Dulles they you know experiment with the mo mobile lounges and what did that work? And so I don't ever thought I would really grow up and design airports, but that was one of my um, one of the things I was really passionate about. about you know, sports and other things, but um, there probably was a better shot that I could become an airport designer than like a major league baseball player. Uh, but it was, uh, but I do think like it does come down to like, how do you organize people? How do you organize a complex system? Uh, it, it, those kinds of challenges, those kinds of problems still are what excite me. Uh, but I never got to, although now I do travel a lot for my job. So I, I also am an expert on Delta Sky Clubs and which gate is, my wife makes fun of me that I know which gate is better at the Minneapolis airport if you're trying to get there quickly and stuff like that. But uh, but I never got to actually design the airport, at least not yet. I shouldn't say never, right? I think, you know, that goes to the point, like from very, very young, curiosity yes. was instilled within you. Like that was a big, huge thing. Yeah, no, it, it definitely was. And I think, you know, I just, I wanted more, and it was such an esoteric topic. It's not like there were tons of books about airports, right? But I, I, I probably have to ask <laughs> I my, I should have asked my mother uh, when I saw this question to see if she remembers like how much, I feel like I remember having like brochures and like, like I just, I liked, wow. I, I wanted yeah. to engage and understand it, right? That's, that's fascinating. I love that. Um, so tell me then, how did that evolve when, when, when you got in, as you got older and started yeah. selecting your topics in school, you know? What it changed and what did you start studying? Yeah, I mean, so it's funny because I don't think I, I certainly don't have a very traditional background. I I would, you know, probably say I, I've never taken really a full college course on data specifically. I mean, maybe adjacent economics or statistics. And in undergrad, I studied philosophy, politics, and economics. Uh, you know, sort of like a good pre-law. I did a little bit, I did a minor in like urban public policy. So again, again, like there are these themes of like complex systems, like a city is a complex system. Um, I went to Penn in West Philly, which was, you know, a city with the good and bad and, you know, how does crime interact and all, all those things. And so uh, I really enjoyed that. And it, it's funny though, and I, I think a theme for me is uh, just, you know, you have to take the opportunities that come. It's not a linear path. And so I actually... My junior year um, in college, I spent a semester in, in Washington, D.C. And so you had classes down there and then you were supposed to get an internship. And I had a couple offers to, um, you know, intern on the Hill, International Relations Committee, or just more traditional things. And then through some, some sort of random connections, I had an offer um, to work in the national campaign to prevent teen pregnancy, um, which was very different. I think they paid, which was nice, but that wasn't the main driver. It was just sort of like, this is something really different, right? And so I'm like, oh, well, 
maybe I should try something different. Not just everyone's going to go work on the Hill. This is an advocacy group, still very Washington based, tied into policy. Um, it was one of the only men that I think were, were in the small office. Um, and they actually were doing a ton of really interesting work around media, um, like working with Buffy the Vampire Slayer to send good messages around safe sex and things like that. Um, but through that, I met a communications company in um, Philadelphia with a Wharton alum that started an African-American Wharton alum that sort of specialized in um, urban communication. So they did everything from like focus groups for like, you know, um, you know, ice teas movies to public health campaigns. And so that's how they were connected to uh, the national campaign to prevent teen pregnancy. And so again, that, it just, that's what happens, right? You, you take a chance, you do something different, you meet someone else. I worked for them my senior year. I went and, um, uh, and uh, worked for them full-time for a little bit after I graduated. And they had a small database system um, that they were using, right? And so I yeah. started using the data to understand their different, you know, contacts for like HIV education campaigns and all this stuff. And I slowly, and it's actually twice in my career, I left um, for a vendor separated by 20 years, right? And so when I was 21, 22, I, um, you know, I think it's sort of like that moment where like when you start calling support and you know more than the support person, right? I just, I ate it up. I knew how to use the system. It was called MSAS, Member Service Action System, built on Interbase and Borland technology, which was very old technology, but powerful. Um, and I was building reports and doing groupings and all, all, all the stuff you do with data, right? Uh, and so I ended up leaving, uh, I think, especially when you leave, um, you know, passionate leaders, there was definitely some, when I was 21, there was some yelling between two founders of a small tech startup and a small communication startup and negotiations of how I would still help, which is, you know, flattering. Um, but so that's really how I got to data was this, this uh, Euclid technology that had like an association management software. Um, and I started using, you know, we, we moved from Interbase, which was sort of an open source database to SQL Server was like our big upgrade. And so I started learning how to build views and store procedures. And as a small company, you just, you needed to be scrappy, right? You couldn't afford to like, like Deloitte or someone to like, you know, just bill people to make things bespoke every time you did it. And so, um, you know, I just, I just started doing that. And then, you know, it's, uh, you know, 20 years later, I did the same thing where I was at Target and I was a customer of Domo and I sort of decided I had this vision for this practice around data curiosity and I, I made the leap as well. And um, I think a lot of it for me in, in my time at Target too, I always talk about like, if you're a consumer of the technology, you end up pushing the envelope. And at some point you want to have a seat at the table and build bigger, bigger envelopes, right? And so I was able to do that um, at Target. Um, you know, even within Target moving, I was originally in finance and then I moved over to um, to more of the data and analytics team. And in between there, I got my MBA, met a girl from Minnesota, moved to Minnesota to get my MBA and then stayed here. So like, but but I think the, the big theme is to me is being open to new experiences, being curious, right? But not, not always being so linear that like I must do A, B, and C. I must be a data analyst at Google, then I must do this and I must do that. Um, you know, I'm, I have to do A, B, and C to become head of product. Well, I didn't have a linear path to that either. It's like do interesting things, meet interesting people. Um, and I think the last thing is have really good leaders and bosses. I think I've been lucky over those years to have people I could trust that could protect me sometimes when I needed protecting that would, you know, encourage my curiosity and my exploration and my growth. And I think without those people, um, you know, probably probably could count on one hand that list of people, but it it, it makes a big difference. I would agree with that. Uh, absolutely. Did you know Dataversity offers free monthly webinar series and online conferences throughout the year? Stay in the loop when you follow us on Twitter at Dataversity or on Instagram at Dataversity underscore edu. Get podcast extras and bonus content when you subscribe to our channel at youtube.com slash dataversity. And, and, and again, what a testament to you and your curiosity. It's not many people who would try those new things go, hey, I want to just do something different. I want to push myself. I want to yeah. explore. Uh, and that's a really uh, great um, yeah. story to tell and yeah. a great way 
<laughs> sometimes <laughs> sometimes yeah. the universe is just sort of, sort of telling you something, right? Whether mm-hmm. it's the nudge because it was paid versus not paid or the fact yeah. that, you know, in finance at Target, I was doing fine, but it felt like I was always pushing, right? Like sort of chafing against the technology. And so, you know, the, the universe tells you things and then things present themselves and you have to grab them. And if you miss them, you, you might end up on a much different path. Yeah, it's so true. So um, what is your uh, definition of data and how do you work with it? Yeah. So um, thinking about this one, you know, I think, and at the core to me, data is is an observation, right? It's an observation mm-hmm. of the world that is recorded somehow. Uh, and I'm often observing many things. Sometimes the things that I observe or notice, mm-hmm. um, my wife, she's, I don't understand why do you care about that? But like, whether the, whether it's, you know, how a restaurant is trying to organize or, um, you know, what's what's going on, you know, even how people are collecting data in the world. So, you know, some bathrooms have like the happy face, smile, you know, sad face. Is this clean or not, right? To try to get more data inputs. And so um, at the core, I think, you know, we we walk through life with a lot of information around us, a lot of things happening. Some of that's recorded, some of it's not. A lot more of it is recorded than it used to be. If you think about cell phones or, um, you know, if I think about, uh, you know, we have like Life360 to track our kids. My oldest is 15. His best friend just got his license. He wants to go for a ride and I can look and see, oh, he went to Culver's to get ice cream, right? I mean, that's that's data that didn't exist for my parents, right? Or if, you know, existed for like the Navy 30 years ago as a, you know, multi-billion dollar investment. And so we do have more and more of that data, which in some ways makes the job of, of, of working with data harder, right? Uh, and I think, you know, you know, one of the inflection points for me at, um, at Domo, and you can actually, you can see it if you look at the data of like what I created, like when I first, when I first joined Domo, like I didn't, I created, but like I wasn't creating a lot of content, you know, around data at Domo. And then when COVID hit, um, that really changed some of my approach and my direct, right? And so we mm-hmm. sort of had a SWAT team to create a COVID tracker. And early in the early days, we we're going to, you know, tens of thousands of users every hour because we were compiling data from John Hopkins and other places we're updating more frequently and how do we blend it? And so that's a lot of those that created those kinds of data experiences, right? Which I talked about for Domo, but this was like a real relevant way to talk about what we did. Um, and I think I, I learned a lot too of like, you know, relevant data that that makes sense to people um, is a way to tell my own journey. It's a way to tell the journey of Domo and what we do. Um, and so we've gone on from, you know, using COVID data to inflation data to even, you know, when when Taylor Swift had all top 10 um, songs on the Billboard charts, we did a blog post I did around the Billboard charts and who had anyone ever done that before? And how do you look at, you know, past um, people and how many songs do they have? They're all using like a, there's a, actually a Python plugin for the Billboard charts. If, you know, anyone wants to do it, I have the code out on GitHub. Uh, but all of that to me, again, that, that's that, that, that sort of, that need, and it, we do this all in a Domo and Data blog, like it does speak to like, it is, there's information out there. There's observations. How do I make sense of it? How do I make it um, meaningful, right? Because you can have data. There's lots of data. How do I make it meaningful? I think is where it gets really powerful and interesting and where I get excited. What a great way to use data for, you know, during COVID and, and yeah. to, you know, to make a difference. Yeah. Um, so tell me, Ben, do you see the importance of data management and the number of jobs working with data increasing or decreasing over the next 10 years and, and why? So I I think overall it will increase. I think it'll change though too, what it means and how you do it, right? Certainly, you know, even in the last five months with ChatGPT and LLMs, it has changed a lot of how we think about what's possible. But there's still sort of that human element of how do you guide, you know, a chat GPT or how do I use chat GPT to give me code as a starting point? And then I make those last, you know, 10% of adjustments that sort of do that. And so uh, I think there still will be that human element. I think, you know, we we continue to to automate more and more. And so I think purely the, the collection of data or the, the pure management of data will, you know, and maybe... And who knows how it sort of that that could become more and more automated and, and 
and maybe a little bit more simple, but um, and it always has, right? Like it's like, you know, every year things get different and, and changes. But I think that that challenge of, you know, how do I get value out of the data? How do I get business impact? How do I create an experience that everyone wants with the data um, will continue to be there? And that's part of where ChatGPT somewhat randomly, they didn't know, they sort of released it to the wild in November as like almost a last ditch effort after some more bespoke efforts to train specific models for accounting or something like that. But why it's like it resonates is because it is so simple and so usable. Um, and so I think finding ways to do that, finding ways, you know, becoming experts on how to prompt a large language model um, in a way that's responsible. How do you, you know, how do you get the right data out of it? How do you organize your data in a way that can be leveraged by a plugin or by a large language model? I think all of that is only going to expand. Um, the people who actually can access it might change. Right. So before you maybe needed to go to a data expert to access to access it. Now I, I rely on a data expert to help translate and mold and deliver it in a manner that I can use. Um, so, you know, I might not need them to answer my question, but I need them to make sure that my question is answerable. Well, that makes sense. Yeah. Makes sense a lot. Uh, and so then what advice would you give to people looking to get into a career in data management? Yeah, so I, I think there's a few things. I think one is, I mean, obviously be curious. I have to say that. <laughs> uh, but, you know, I think when I, you know, certainly from a career perspective, it's, you know, thinking about how do you explore new technology? Uh, think about what your approach is. That's something I ask people a lot is like, I don't care as much about which technology, but I want to know how do you learn, right? How did you learn something brand new? How did you change the way you did things? Because, that's the only thing I know for sure is that there'll continue to be new technology that you need to understand, whether it's Python or R or GPT or, you know, vector databases or whatever it is. And so the more that you build that muscle and, and show to me, so while I guess sometimes I'm hiring for an expertise, I more want to hire for someone who shows me they can adapt, right? And so if you've gotten really good at one technology, but can never tell me a story about when you had to explore new technology from scratch, except for that one technology, look, there might be times when you need that or you need a specialist. But I think having that, it's not lack of specialization, but having that ability to pick up a new specialty, I think is really big uh, and being able to do that. And then look, I think the other thing, like, like I sort of said before is, you know, like keep your eyes open for the different pathway, right? Like you don't know that linear path and keep your eyes open for who you're working with and for, uh, Cause end of the day, like that's, that's really what makes, at least from a career perspective, that makes a difference. And, and, you know, who are you spending time with? Who are you traveling with? Who are you in the trenches with? If there's a big deadline or a project. And uh, so all of that, it's really hard if you don't trust and respect the people you work with. And so, you know, I would pick certainly better people, more interesting problems over title and pay right away. But, those things matter. We all want to make more money. We all want a nice title. It's nice, all those things. But I think you have to sort of balance between them. Oh, I agree with that. That's great advice. And, you know, along with your um, curiosity, it sounds like there's also uh, some uh, advice to be uncomfortable. It's okay to be yes. uncomfortable, to push yourself yeah. to, in new situations, new environments, new things. Um. So, yeah. which, yeah, really great yeah. message. Yeah. I think a lot of it, I often talk, um, a lot of the research actually around curiosity overall, and there's been Harvard, you know, business review articles and stuff, like comes, talks about the concept of intellectual humility. Um, mm -hmm. Right. And I think that's something I, I try to go on. And it's hard because I know a lot. I think I know a lot. I think I'm right a lot. But sometimes you just have to make sure like you're, you're, let out your guard, you're questioning whether someone else knows more than you, right? Like I'm not always the opposite of intellectual hubris. Uh, I'm open to learning something new. I'm listening to someone else who might have a different opinion or a different approach. Um, and it doesn't mean like you're perfect. There's plenty of times when I'm sure my team or my customers would tell you I, I have exercised intellectual hubris in, in my interactions. But, but again, if you can check yourself and reset to that, I think it is that openness, the humility, to be able to know what you don't know or to want to learn something new. Because if you're not comfortable with that ambiguity, if you're not comfortable with that, that 
being humble, it, it gets really hard to learn because like it's it's hard, right? It's it is uncomfortable, like you said. And so if you're not willing to do that, you're gonna sort of have an issue learning something new. Such great advice all the way around and and not just career advice, I think great life advice. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> indeed. And and I can attest, you know, I I'm I love my job and my colleagues and Tony Shaw is one of the best human beings that we've, you know, yeah. to work for. Um but we've all been there right, with those bad managers and that just, you're right, yeah. it can make life miserable and it's so important, your choices. So, and if you follow your passion, follow those, that curiosity, like you say, the salary and type, yeah. those will come. Yeah. yeah. I believe so. <laughs> well, Ben, so I would be remiss though if I didn't ask how, if, if people wanted to um, learn more about Domo, how would yes. they find out? So you certainly can always find me on LinkedIn or email me or direct message me if you have questions or, or if you're a customer, your products feedback, I'm always, always open to that. Um, or it's ben.schein at Domo, but on, on our website, domo.com, um, we actually did a lot of revamping at part of our user conference in March in terms of focusing around these data experiences, being clear around the architecture, um, walkthroughs of, of different parts of the platform and whatnot you know the domo data blog has some if you want to explore how taylor switch is doing now or miley cyrus had like some record of number one hits in a row or whatever so um all that is out there but we're always looking for good data conversations and help people on their their own curiosity journeys right what are they trying to learn Oh, fun. It's so fun. Well, Ben, thank you so much for taking time to be with us today. And as to all of our listeners out there, if you'd like to keep up to date in the latest in podcasts and the latest in data management education, you may go to dataversity.net forward slash subscribe. Until next time. Thank you for listening to Dataversity Talks, a podcast brought to you by Dataversity. Subscribe to our newsletter for podcast updates and information about our free educational webinars at dataversity.net forward slash subscribe. Mm -hmm.